Prize Essay, Pro Bono Publico, by Edward Bum Gardner, A.M. M.D., Lawrence, Kansas. Published June 24, 1902. Not long since a wave of disapproval swept over a certain western state when the statement was made that the physician of a public institution of that state, without any examination of patients, to ascertain whether the medicine was indicated in their particular cases, was in the habit of treating sick inmates by the use of old prescriptions which had been written for other patients. Without assuming that any such thing ever happened, we may safely assert that no intelligent citizen would ever contend that such a thing ever should happen. Everyone will admit that the physician in charge of a hospital should be thoroughly trained in the science and art of medicine, and that he should use his training for the best interests of the patients. It will also be admitted that he can perform his duties properly, whether in the hospital or in a private practice, only by making a special study of each case of sickness. No two things in nature are exactly alike, and no two people ever have even the same disease in exactly the same form. Fortunately for us, however, the laws of nature are as immutable as the stars. The same causes always produce the same effects. A very limited study of philosophy teaches us that we cannot chain nature, although we are accustomed to the use of that phrase in a figurative sense. When we put ourselves in harmony with one of the nature's laws, it serves us. When we get in opposition to it, it destroys us. Disease is always the result of violated law. Cures can only be produced by placing the patient in harmony with nature's laws. No one else can secure this harmony so surely as the man who has made a special study of the laws involved and of the particular case in hand. People concede these facts in a general way. Confidence in the value of medical education is not confined to those who possess it. The reliance of public opinion on scientific medicine has been tested and won by countless demonstrations. Plagues and epidemics are not dreaded as they once were. The words cholera, smallpox, and yellow fever do not convey the same feelings of terror to the public mind as they did a generation ago, because physicians have shown that the spread of these diseases can be prevented by a knowledge and application of natural laws. The science of medicine is gaining the confidence that was once placed in talismans and charms, and yet people do not have enough medical common sense. When his own health is concerned, the average citizen seems to think that consistency is a jewel so precious that he cannot afford it. The same man who would not cease to condemn a physician if he were known to have a single remedy for typhoid fever will pour into his innocent stomach a nauseous mixture in utter ignorance, not only of its composition, but of the disease from which he may be suffering. It is only necessary for him to read that the said mixture has cured others, will cure you. Human nature loves mystery. The mystery of the composition of a patent medicine seems to have fascination for many people which may well be compared with the element of uncertainty in gambling. The hypochondriac is forever betting on another's man's game. Great harm is done to the public in these days by self-medication. It would be well if all people were as slow about dosing themselves as our physicians. At first thought, it would seem that a man whose everyday work is the selection of remedies for sick people would know exactly what to do for himself when he gets sick. On the other hand, a sick physician always wants the advice of a well physician. He knows that guesswork will no more solve problems in medical science than it will in mathematics. He knows also that the value of medical treatment lies not so much in drugs as in the man whose training and judgment enable him to select the proper drug for a given case if one is needed. A sick man does not need medicine so much as he needs medical attention. Drugs are very useful and often necessary, but a suffering person is not competent to select the indicated drug and any other is sure to do harm. This is the reason physicians do not treat themselves. People often make the mistake of thinking that the reason is because physicians do not have faith in the drugs they use. The sick man who does not understand drugs 
will always do well to follow the example of the sick man who does understand them, and let them alone unless prescribed by one who knows what he is prescribing and why. The term patent medicine is a misnomer. Under the Constitution of the United States, Congress is given power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And the law based upon this clause states that a patent may be obtained by any person who has invented or discovered any new and useful art, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter not known or used by others in this country. A patent is a contract between the inventor and the government by which the former is granted the exclusive right to produce a new and useful thing for a limited time in consideration of his publishing a full knowledge of his invention at the expiration of the time designated. The purpose of the patent law is to benefit the public by diffusion of knowledge. If a patent were desired on any new medicine, a statement of the drugs entering into its composition and the exact method of combining them would be required in the application. This is just what the manufacturers of so-called patent medicines are unwilling to have done. Their desire is to possess a perpetual monopoly and to prevent the composition of their mixtures from being known. So instead of applying for a patent, they invent a name which they have registered as a trademark. In this way, they are able to monopolize the sale of a name and advertise their compounds as remedies that ordinary physicians and pharmacists cannot duplicate. It is difficult to understand how people can believe that the manufacturers of Nostrums possesses valuable secrets that science does not reveal to the medical profession in general. Most people know that there is such a thing as chemical analysis and that by it the composition of unknown substances can be determined. As a matter of fact, this scientific method has been employed time and again in the examination of widely advertised compounds and the results published for the public good. The State Boards of Health of Massachusetts and New York were pioneers in this good work, which has been taken up by competent chemists in various parts of the country. Reliable data on this subject can be obtained by anyone who wishes to know the composition of the much-lauded pancreas. A little study of the subject will convince an intelligent person not only of the exorbitant price, but of the utter worthlessness and absolute injury seriousness of a typical patent medicine. It is not enough to say that most secret preparations do no good. Their power for harm is evident to all who investigate. Most of the advertised cosmetics and hair restorers, to begin with the beauty medicines, have mercury, lead, bismuth, or zine entering very largely into their composition. Madame Rupert's face bleach and Miss Harriet Hubbard's R's Recomere Balm and Recomere Moth and Freckle Lotion contain corrosive sublimate. Lard's Balm of Youth, Hagen's Magnolia Balm, and Bradford's Enamaline contain oxide of zinc. Professor C. F. Chandler analyzed eight of the best-known hair restorers and renewers and reported to the New York Board of Health that they all contain lead, some as much as seven grains to the ounce. To the person who knows the action of these mineral poisons, comment is unnecessary, and we submit that they should not be used by persons who do not know their action. One of the drugs that should never be taken without a physician's advice is opium. Occasionally we hear of a death resulting from an overdose of some preparation of opium, but a far greater amount of damage is done to persons who are not killed outright. In England, 1581, deaths were reported in five years as caused by various poisons. Of these, 643 were caused by opium. Blythe says, the more considerable mortality arises in great measure from the pernicious practice of giving infants various forms of opium sold under the name of soothing syrups, infants' friends, nurses' drops, and the like, to allay restlessness and to keep them during the greater part of their existence asleep. Of all the crimes against childhood, 
fewer can be greater than that of making helpless infants into opiate inebriates. Let no one doubt that this is done in countless cases every year. Let him remember the fact that children are peculiarly susceptible to the formation of drug habits, and then notice what chemistry proves in regard to opium in a few of the nostrums advertised so extensively. After this, if there remains in his mind even the shadow of a doubt, let him observe how difficult it is to wean a baby from a soothing syrup that has been administered to it for a short time. Soothing syrups all contain opium. Perhaps the best example to mention in passing is Mrs. Wilson's Soothing Syrup. A two-ounce bottle of it contains a half grain of the sulfate of morphine. Cough syrups next claim our attention. Dr. Bull's cough syrup is put in bottles holding three ounces. Analysis shows that each ounce contains more than one-fourth grain of the sulfate of morphine. The caution label of the bottle is very good advice. Medicine should never be kept within the reach of children. It is highly important to pay strict attention to the directions for taking Dr. Bull's cough syrup. Another well-known cough remedy contains three-fourths of a grain of the acetate of morphine to the ounce. A certain consumption cure is now put up in small bottles only. The reason for this is easy to understand when we learn that this mixture is not a permanent solution and that the last dose from the larger bottle formerly used was sometimes taken with fatal results. The manufacturers are governing themselves according to the supposition that half of a fatal dose of precipitated morphine and cannabis indica will not be fatal. So great a fraud as Dr. Buckland's Scotch Oats Essence deserves a few lines here. This is not a temporary and fleeting stimulant, but a permanent tonic. Its use must be regular and continued over a considerable period. Dose 10 to 15 drops to a teaspoonful three or four times daily, increased as needed. It contains 35% of alcohol and one-fourth of a grain of morphine to the ounce. It is recommended for the cure of inebriety and the opium habit. Cocaine is a drug resembling opium in that it produces an enslaving and most injurious habit. In less than three months, there appeared in the police court of Chicago 40 victims of the cocaine habit induced largely by the use of catara snuffs containing this drug. So we might go on naming nostrums which contain chloral, strychnine, henbane, theodorals, and bromines, the various coulter products and other poisons, though the manufacturers of each compound assure us that their preparation is perfectly harmless. If patent medicines had been advertised in the time of the psalmist as they are today, he certainly would have been excusable for deciding in his haste that all men are liars. The one poison that is used in nearly all nostrums is alcohol. To quote Blythe again, if we were to include in one list the deaths indirectly due to chronic as well as acute poisoning by alcohol, it would stand first of all poisons in the order of frequency. By the taking of doses so large as to cause death in a few hours is rare. Physicians are recognizing more and more the harm done by alcohol and are continuing to use it less, even as a menstruum to carry other drugs. A few examples will show, however, that its use is considered quite necessary in the manufacture of patent medicines. Perhaps to appease the appetite that is developed by the long-continued use of these same remedies which is recommended. Here is a short list of patent medicines with the percentage of alcohol contained in each. Green's Nervura 17.2, Hood's Sarsaparilla 18.8, Schneck's Seaweed Tonic 19.5, Brown's Iron Bitters 19.7, Kaufman's Sulfur Bitters 20.5, Payne's Celery Compound, 21.0. Burdock Blood Bitters, 23.2. Ars Sarsaparilla, 26.2. Warner's Safe Tonic Bitters, 35.7. Parker's Tonic, 41.6. Hostetter's Stomach Bitters, 44.3. 
there is but one verdict that can be rendered against the whole Nostrum business when it is weighed in the balance. But what is to be done about it? The best weapon with which to fight error is always truth. For their own good, the people must be educated on the subject. They must be shown the disastrous effects of self-drugging, especially with remedies having secret formulae. This will not be an easy matter with the newspapers of the country on the wrong side of the question at the beginning and with ministers, lawyers, and other prominent citizens who do not know what they are talking about always ready to write testimonials for Nostrums. The politicians have told us about the subsidized press. Every reader knows that the greatest subsidy paid to our newspaper, usually more than is received on subscriptions, is to secure the publication of advertisements, some of which are a disgrace to the press of this country. Most papers contain matter in advertisements that is absolutely unfit to enter our homes or to be read by decent people. Newspaper men should be made to understand that public opinion does not sanction the publication of untruthful, obscene, and ridiculous advertisements. Some of the worst features of patent medicine nuisance can be abated by proper legislation. We need a law requiring the formula and method of preparation of every proprietary remedy to be printed on the label. Such a law would prevent much deception in the names of preparations. Then the state boards of health should be authorized to investigate the adulterations of foods and medicines and to require that the contents of the bottle shall correspond with the published formula. The duty of leading this crusade devolves upon the physicians of the country, however unpleasant the work may be to them. Their motives will often be impeached. They will often be accused of selfishness and of opposing the desires of the people, but such things cannot always be separated from professional duty. The devoted physician who uses every proper method to assist in making the truth known in regard to patent medicines will sometime be given credit such as he is now beginning to receive for having made modern sanitation possible.